Hello and welcome to Radio Astronomy, the podcast from the makers of BBC Sky at Night magazine. You can subscribe to the print edition of the magazine by visiting skyatnightmagazine.com or to our digital edition by visiting iTunes or Google Play. Greetings listeners, I'm news editor Ezzy Pearson and today I'm joined on the podcast by production editor Neil McKim. Hello. Coming up later in this episode, we'll be giving you our stargazing tip of the month. But first, we're going to take a closer look at some of the things we found out whilst putting together the March issue of Sky at Night magazine. In this month's issue, we both look at the largest asteroid Vesta, which is currently at our position, and also the upcoming return of NASA's mission OSIRIS-REx, which will be coming back with a sample of an asteroid in May. And so we thought it was time on the podcast to take a look at these space rocks that we find throughout our solar system. Yeah, that's right. Um, And I've been taking a look basically at how asteroids were discovered. We can go back over several centuries to 1596 when Johannes Kepler noticed there was a gap between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter and stated the likelihood of a planet. And following this the Titius Bode law set out a numerical formula for finding this missing planet. And when William Herschel discovered Uranus in 1781, the planet's orbit matched this law almost perfectly, leading astronomers to hunt in earnest for a planet in the gap between Mars and Jupiter. The first object in the region to be discovered was Ceres in 1801 by Giuseppe Piazzi, which is the largest object in the asteroid belt. Initially believed to be a planet, it was later reclassified as an asteroid and then more recently as a dwarf planet. 15 months later, Heinrich Olbers discovered Pallas and in 1802, Herschel, again, uh, getting in there, suggested that these new discoveries should be called asteroids. So he coined the name but it didn't actually catch on for several decades. By 1807, Juno and Vesta had been added to the list, but it wasn't until the 1850s when the term asteroid really began to take hold, and the expression asteroid belt also came into use at this time. By the late 1860s, 100 asteroids had been found, and by 1921, this had risen to 1,000, And at the turn of the 21st century, it was 100,000. NASA's Galileo mission was the first spacecraft to fly past an asteroid when it flew past Gaspara in 1991. And the near-Earth asteroid rendezvous near Shoemaker studied asteroids Matilda and Eros, while the Rosetta mission encountered Steins and Lutetia. In 2005, Japanese spacecraft Hayabusa landed on the near-Earth asteroid Itokawa and attempted to collect samples. It brought back a small amount of asteroid dust that's now being studied by scientists. NASA's Dawn spacecraft, launched in 2007, orbited and explored Vesta, which we mentioned earlier, for over a year before it went on to orbit Ceres. And coming up to date, Hayabusa 2 came back at the end of last year with samples from Ryugu and OSIRIS-REx is now preparing to leave Bennu in May to bring its samples home. It always surprises me when you learn how recently we found out about the asteroid belt. It's kind of, it's like this major feature of our solar system, but we've only actually known about it for about 200 years, which, you know, seeing as people have known about other bits of the sky since, you know, we first developed eyes. (laughs) It's kind of, it's quite odd to think that they've just been out there and we didn't know they were. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And the fact that people found them kind of just looking for planets as well. That's that's quite, yeah, extraordinary. And I've also been looking at a bit at the um, stats about the asteroid belt. So some facts and figures. So it was being located between Jupiter and Mars And it's largely made up from rocky objects that range in size from the dwarf planet Ceres, um, the largest object with a whopping diameter of 950 kilometres, 
ranging right down to the size of a dust particle. The belt is estimated to contain between 1.1 and 1.9 million asteroids, which are larger than a kilometre in diameter and millions of smaller ones. And the total mass of the asteroid belt is just 4% of our moon, with half its mass contained in the four largest objects, Ceres, Vesta, Pallas and Hygieia. And a common misconception is that the belt is de densely populated, but it's not. And it's not like the closely packed region of rocks which we often see in sci-fi films. In fact, it's likely that 99.9% of its original mass was lost in the first 100 million years of our solar system's history. And aside from main belt asteroids, there's a couple of other types to mention. First are Trojans, which share an orbit with a larger planet, but don't collide with it. Um, Jupiter has the most significant population of these. And Mars and Neptune have Trojans too. And indeed, NASA announced there was one discovered with Earth back in 2011. Mm. Yes, basically asteroids tend to end up where there's a wherever there's a nice little gravitational well for them to sit in. Um, it's the reason why the asteroid belt is where the asteroid belt is, is because that's where Jupiter kind of shepherds them all into. The other type are near-Earth asteroids, which have orbits that pass close by Earth. Um, these are monitored closely in case they are a potential hazard, and the near-wise, near-Earth object wide field infrared survey explorer spacecraft is conducting an accurate survey of these. It's worth mentioning also that times have moved on since the tradition of naming asteroids after Greek gods. There's some familiar names out there these days, including Nimoy after Star Trek's Mr. Spock actor, as well as famous musicians Lennon, McCartney, Harrison, and even Shakespeare. It's also worth mentioning another belt in the solar system, the Kuiper belt, which extends outwards from Neptune's orbit. This is far larger than the asteroid belt, about 20 to 200 times as massive. And a bit like the asteroid belt, it consists of bodies from when the solar system formed, but these are made of ice rather than rock. Yes, both the asteroid belt and the Kuiper belt are, are basically different parts of the leftovers from the formation of the solar system. Uh, that's why we have such interest in both of these reasons. Uh, the asteroid belt is, as I said earlier, it basically ends up where it is because Jupiter is this big, massive planet that's kind of a bit of a gravitational bully when it comes to the solar system. It basically, it tells the rest of the solar system where all the planets and asteroids are going to be. And so that ended up with this nice kind of gravitationally stable place between Mars and Jupiter. And there's kind of two theories really about why the asteroid belt, you know, how it ended up being as full as it is. Um, there's the kind of traditional view, which was that it was once much, much fuller um, and that a bunch of stuff got kicked out. So perhaps once there had been a planet there, but it got pulled apart by Jupiter or maybe it's just all of the place where, where things ended up. And then gradually over time, lots of material got kicked out. There is, however, another theory coming up, which is that maybe it's a place where things have fallen into and got caught. Um, so, for instance, Lewis Dartnell talks about in his Cutting Edge column uh, the fact that Ceres and Vesta look very similar in terms of their orbits, but their compositions are very different from each other. So their orbits suggested that they formed together, but their compositions suggest that they didn't, that they formed in completely different places. So that suggests either one or both of them started life somewhere else and then moved into this position. Exactly which one's true uh, is still being worked out, it's still being researched. Um, space science is always changing and always evolving. And, and in truth, it might actually be that there's an element of both, that a lot of the material started life in the asteroid belt, but occasionally the odd bit got caught in there from further out. We'll just have to wait and see. Um, and that's why all of these missions going to the asteroid belt, and particularly the ones that are bringing samples back, are so 
interesting because they give us this direct hands-on view of what the asteroid belt was like. Um, And this also shows us what was there at the beginning of the solar system's formation. Like I said, the asteroid belt is the planetary leftovers. Um, Some of the asteroids originated from before any of the planets formed. It's the very primordial stuff that was around in the solar system before the planets formed. And then you have other asteroids still, which were actually once part of uh, planetesimals. So that's kind of like the baby planets that then merged together, form the bigger ones, or in the case of the asteroids, got completely fragmented apart. And so you can see some asteroids which look like they came from the, uh, the heart of a planet, and we can see what was going on inside of, of a planet's core or ones that came from a bit further out. And that's why the asteroid belt is so interesting to get to grips with. It lets us know what was around before any of the planets formed. And that's why this current mission that's coming back, Osiris Rex, is really going to be interesting. And Hayabusa too, as well. Um, because both of these are sample return missions. That means they went to the asteroid, they examined the asteroid took a lump of dirt and are have either already brought that back or are about to start bringing it back. So OSIRIS-REx is due to come back to Earth uh, in 2023, but it's going to be leaving in May. So in two months' time, it's going to start making its way back to Earth. And OSIRIS-REx is uh, does lots of things. Um, as you can tell by its incredibly complicated name, Its full name is the Origins Spectral Interpretation Resource Identification Security Regolith Explorer. I can see why they call it Osiris Rex. Much more pronounceable. Um, But each of those bits basically tells you that another thing that this spacecraft is doing. So Origins, it's telling us about the origins of the solar system and looking at this very primordial asteroid. The asteroid that it's at is called Bennu. Um, It arrived there on the 3rd of December in 2018. And it's a very old asteroid. It formed in around the first 10 million years of the solar system. So when the solar system was very, astronomically speaking, young, um, when the planets were still all forming. So this is the, the, it's made of the stuff that was a, the planets got made out of. Uh, next, you have spectral interpretation and resource identification. Uh, basically, this just means it's got lots of spectrometers on it um, to be able to tell what the space rock is made up of. That's what it's been doing for the last two years. It's been looking at every single angle of the space rock, trying to get to understand exactly what Bennu is made of, what elements are there. Um, and also when it takes this sample, it so, so the spacecraft itself gets a much broader and, and sort of less refined view of what's in the asteroid and what's it's made up of. And then it'll bring a sample back and we'll be able to tell in great detail exactly what this asteroid is made out of. And then finally, you've got the last bit of that, which is security. Um, And one of the goals of OSIRIS-REx is that it wants to be like one day, a big old lump of rock might be heading towards Earth and we might need to deflect it. And so by really studying exactly what an asteroid looks like and what it's made up of, that'll help us in the future if we need to deflect it. So one of the really interesting things they found on very early on at Osiris Rex is that it's not just a big single block of rock. It's more like a, a pile of rubble um, that's loosely hauled together. Around 20 to 40 percent of its insides is empty space. And if you know we were trying to do an Armageddon and fire Bruce Willis at it, or however that works, um it would probably just completely shatter and break apart rather than um, being slowed down, which is how we'd actually probably deflect an asteroid. So knowing that sort of thing is really potentially important several years down the road if a big asteroid decides to come and hit Earth. Um, But one of the really interesting things that in the more close term, one of the first things that they'll be looking at um, 
when those samples arrive back in Earth uh, at 2023, is looking to see what elements there are. Um, what could these asteroids have brought to Earth? Because we think that asteroids are probably one of the main ways that um, precious metals and certain elements came to Earth. So the Earth formed and then asteroids rained down and kind of sprinkled the Earth with various elements and things. Um, and it was these elements that ended up giving us the ingredients to form life. So there's lots going on with the OSIRIS-REx mission. It's going to be really interesting. And I'm really interested to see when it eventually comes back. Yeah. And, and weren't they um, briefly worried that they'd lost some of the samples when they were collecting them? Yes, they did. Uh it landed back on the 20th of October of 2020. Um, it did something called a touch and go method, which basically it kind of ran up, hit it, fired a, a nitrogen canister, nitrogen gas into the surface, which blasted up a load of dust that then got forced into its um, capture places. It was then supposed to shut itself down down so it, it kind of had like these self-sealing mylar flaps that would stop the the material from escaping unfortunately it did its job a little bit too well <laughs> and those flaps didn't close properly because there was too many big rocks in there that were kind of keeping them open and that was great because it meant they had lots of nice like big rocks that we'll be able to look at um in two years time but it unfortunately meant that a lot of the dust and the small particles were slowly escaping into space. Um, and in our feature in the, the March issue, there's one of the, the people involved says about how he was watching and he was just thinking, oh, my God, every grain, there goes somebody's PhD. Um, so what they did was they sealed it up um, in the container that will eventually bring it back to Earth. Um, because this is entirely sealed and contained, even if those grains got shaken out of the, the canister, they weren't going to go anywhere. They were completely, you know, secured. Um, I think the initial plan had been to try and do a second touch and go. That wasn't necessary. Um, they had too much as it was. Um, so it's it's been an interesting mission. Yeah. Yeah. So fingers crossed. Definitely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Hopefully it comes back nice and safely. Hayabusa 2 did all right. I think they're getting pretty good at, at returning salt canisters to Earth at this point. It's not the first sample return mission that NASA has ever done. They've done a couple before. So hopefully we'll see those landing back safely in September 2023. There are some great photo opportunities for Mars this month as the planet parades across our sky. From the 1st to the 5th, of March, the red planet will be making its way past the Pleiades star cluster, offering a great opportunity for imaging. Then, on the 19th of March, it creates another striking sight when it teams up with the crescent moon and bright star Aldebaran. If you can find the crescent moon on the night sky, you should be able to see two bright points above and below forming a line. These will have a similar colour and brightness but Mars will be the one highest in the sky and closest to the moon, whereas Aldebaran will be lower below the moon and further from it. The trio is best viewed in the early evening and it should be visible from when the sun sets at 6.30pm to around 11pm when it will be too low on the horizon to make out. So that's it from us this month. You can find out more about asteroids in the March issue of BBC Sky at Night magazine where we also teach you all about the aurora, take a look back at Galileo and this first ever scientific work written using a telescope, and we talk to the scientific lead of the latest Mars mission from the United Arab Emirates. And that's not forgetting our regular sections that will help you unlock the wonder of the night sky, find the right equipment to observe it with, and discover the best things to see after dark this month. From all of us here at Sky Night Magazine, goodbye. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Radio Astronomy Podcast from the makers of BBC Sky at Night magazine, which was produced in our Bristol studio by Jack Bateman and Ben Hewitt. For more of our podcasts, visit our website at skyatnightmagazine.com or head to iTunes, Acast or Spotify. Spotify.